We'll begin with water and some of its known electromagnetic properties and how this allows water to absorb and radiate energy and information. And it's really this mediator between our energy expression and our consciousness. So here we have a H2O water molecule. That's two hydrogens, one oxygen. We see that oxygen atom there. We see the electrons as those black dots. We see the hydrogen here. And effectively what happens with a single water molecule is that there is a higher electron density near the oxygen atom. This creates a net charge that's negative. So we see that net negative charge there. Whereas the hydrogen atoms, they have a lower electron density overall and thus a net positive charge. This creates a dipole. So you have this negative here, one pole, and then you have the overall positive side here, the other pole, so a dipole. And these electrons are kind of floating through these clouds probabilistically, but they're more often around the oxygen. So it creates this dipole and it becomes a polar molecule. So water has this net charge differentiation, making each water molecule a little magnet effectively. It's a polar molecule, basically a little magnet. And as a result, they connect together electromagnetically based on this charge separation and not necessarily based on like molecular bonds that you have here. These are called hydrogen bonds when they connect via these uh, charge differences. Now, there's also a factor with water that water molecules naturally form an ordered crystalline structure, especially when in contact with material surfaces. So if you have some sort of surface here, let's say this is the outside of a cell, it's a cell membrane, right? Then you will form these layers of water and it has this crystalline structure like this. And this is known as EZ water, the EZ standing for exclusion zone. And this negatively charged honeycomb structure, you see that right here, crystallizes and pushes out any non-water substances into the surrounding water, which is called bulk water, and that will be slightly positively charged. So this material here causes water to crystallize and this easy zone gets bigger when there's radiant light coming in. It expands by like two to three times. And so this forms a net negative charge. And then the rest of the water, because this has slightly more negative charge, the rest of the water takes on a positive charge. It also will contain all those other substances that may be dissolved into the water uh, that get kicked out of the exclusion zone. So not only does water have a charge differentiation at the molecular level here with the hydrogen and oxygen, you know, the positive there, the negative there, it also forms this natural charge separation at larger scales, at a collective scale. And there's also uh, quantum coherency do domains that exist and form that are able to trap energy based on some of these electromagnetic factors. Now, something to keep in mind is DNA is surrounded by water completely. Here we have a graphic showing a DNA double helix, and we see some highly structured water molecules there in red. And then in this light blue, we see some less structured water molecules. There's a little bit more room. Uh, of course, these actually may be more structured than we think. Uh, but these get really structured and tight due to the uh, due to being confined pretty closely by this double helix. But effectively, DNA, which we know is a fractal antenna and highly conductive, has free electrons within its base pairs. Those can move and cause conformational changes in uh, different expression of DNA. It's completely hydrated on all sides by these little water magnets. And so electromagnetic forces have a strong ability to govern the expression of DNA and the production of proteins mediated through water. And there are experiments showing that water can absorb and radiate information. We'll look at that on the next slide. The natural polarity of a water molecule and the larger charge separation that occurs with bulk water is the foundation of cellular voltage gradients which have been shown to govern DNA expression in individual plus group cell behavior. So there's work from Robert Becker, there's work from uh, Michael Levin, 
uh, on these cellular voltage gradients, how they influence a repair, regeneration, cell death, the expression of DNA. And so, of course, if you have these water molecules that are little magnets, and then you get things like EZ water forming around different proteins, forming around the cell, uh, different exosomes, and all these different cellular components, you know, within bacteria, outside of bacteria, everything that has some sort of material that's different than water will generally form easy water around it or within it. And so you get these charge separations and that is going to be the basis for the cellular voltage gradients. Now cellular voltage gradients are also going to be determined by ions like calcium, like sodium, potassium, magnesium. Uh, those will influence the you know larger cellular voltage gradients and where those ions are, whether they're inside the cell, whether they get pumped out of the cell into the, the surrounding matrix. But this electromagnetic charge separation of water is the foundation of those cellular voltage gradients and forms a lot of cellular behaviors through the action on things like DNA and proteins and more. So water emits radiant energy. And the frequencies emitted depend on the structure of the water because of the variation of charge distribution across materials, molecules, and proteins. So you have water, uh, you know, completely hydrating and surrounding different materials like let's say cell membrane or DNA. And the specific structure of that material or protein or molecule, larger molecule, will determine the dipole arrangement of these water molecules. So now they take on a specific form and shape and structure. Uh, uh, you know, the crystalline structure is very adaptable to the different materials that they're in contact with. So this encodes surface specific information into the electromagnetic energy that's radiated by water. And research suggests that this is profoundly important biologically. There are experiments done by Luc Montagnier and team. Uh, he was a noblest. He discovered the HIV virus. He passed away, I think, November 2019. May he rest in peace. And uh, effectively what they did is they put some uh, sample DNA in this vial of water. And then they had pure water in sample B. So there's, there's vial B. There's no DNA there. It's completely pure, untouched. Then they exposed vial A to electromagnetic energy, actually at 7 hertz, which is the first mode of the Schumann resonances. So they put the, these vials within a new metal cage. New metal is a type of metal that absorbs uh, all electromagnetic energy and magnetic fields, even extremely low frequency ones. So you can shield out Earth's magnetic field with new metal. It's NU metal. And so they put it in new metal, and but within that new metal box, they had this solenoid that was emitting a 7 hertz wave. This was a carrier wave, effectively, and they did that for about 16 or 24 hours. And there was some sort of information exchange that occurred, it seems, because then when they took vial B and added DNA precursor material, all the nucleic acids needed for DNA, but they're, they're not assembled at all, they're just just kind of a, a pile of Legos, you could say. And then they amplified that sample using PCR, which allows for the, uh, the replication of certain DNA strands. When they then did they, the sequence on that sample, they observed a 98% identical DNA sequence as to the one that was in sample A, uh, vial A right there. So that was two base pairs different out of 104. And so the probability of that is insane. If you were to do each base, there's four different types of base pairs and you put the probabilities on it. I mean, it's ridiculous. So it's 98% identical. And this is because the information for the structuring of that DNA, the specific ordering of those uh, base pairs was carried by that 7 hertz electromagnetic Schumann resonance from the first vial to the second vial and that energy was encoded into the clean water. There was no DNA in that vial. It was absorbed by the water, and then that energy and information was able to inform 
the, uh, the nucleic acids on how to connect and combine together once they were there in the sample and once PCR was uh, added to the equation allowing for the, the, the building of DNA. So really incredible work done by Luc Montagnier. They, they, they wouldn't let this get published in any of the main research papers because they thought it was, you know, it's one of these, uh, one of these things that is just too groundbreaking for mainstream science. So they published it in some different papers. They expanded on this. You can read all those papers. I'll put the original research paper in the video description. Um, these are Schumann resonances right here. So Earth's naturally resonant frequencies of light energy. They're created by things like lightning. Uh, they're also created by solar radiation hitting the ionosphere. And the foundational mode is 7.8 hertz. You also have modes at 14, 20, 26, 33, 39, 45. So the higher the frequency, the faster, the more in information can be encoded into that wave. But 7.8 hertz uh, is the foundational mode of Schumann resonances. It varies from about 7.2 to 8.8. .8. They use a seven hertz wave here. So we are constantly bathed in this seven to nine hertz energy naturally due to the Schumann resonances. And according to this, research here just a seven hertz wave was able to exchange that information from vial a to vial b and allow for the reconstruction of this viral dna sequence so it seems that water in this way functions as a biologic antenna transmitting and receiving energy and information now this is this goes even more into it okay so the human body is highly conductive we we know this uh, we our cell phones when you are using your cell phone the reason why you can uh, use the screen is because your finger is conductive if you use something that's resistive the screen doesn't uh, register the input that's why you can use like uh, aluminum foil it's conductive it'll, it'll allow the manipulation of that screen or if you have gloves that allow you to use your cell phone, it's because they have silver on the end, which is highly conductive. So our body is naturally very, very conductive. And we, we carry this energy in charge. We are our electromagnetic beings. And if we go into that, one of the main reasons why is because of water. We're, we're basically a big sack of flesh that's water, and then there's a whole bunch of ions in there. You have all those ions, like calcium and sodium and more. So those are charged carriers, there's other aspects too, but we're super conductive. One of the most striking properties of water is its electric susceptibility. So here's something that is really important. The absorption of EMFs at frequencies sub one gigahertz, this is 10 to the nine hertz, one gigahertz. The absorption of EMFs at frequencies sub one gigahertz by water is pretty low. But when you go from one gigahertz to 100 gigahertz, the power absorption of water increases dramatically. So we know that exposure to artificial radio frequency electromagnetic fields has increased significantly in recent decades. And these energies generate heat in body tissues. They're non-ionizing. They don't break molecular bonds instantly like a x-ray does. Uh, and so we know that they generate heat in body tissues, but weak electromagnetic fields, these non-ionizing en energies, also have non-thermal effects on body cells, tissues, organs, things like extremely low frequency energy fields like the Schumann resonances are still able to cause the movement of electrons in the body. This can cause conformational changes in proteins, also change the activation of DNA. So the exposure to these artificial radio frequency electromagnetic fields has exploded over the past like 50, 60, 70 years, but really in the past 20 years with the advent of cell phones and everyone having a cell phone and increasing uh, information density within those waves. So they've moved from 1G and 2G and 3G networks to 4G and now 5G and 4G LTE networks, they use frequencies of about 500 megahertz to 2.5 gigahertz. 
So you see 2.5 gigahertz, one gigahertz. It's right at the beginning of this power absorption increase for water. 5G cellular networks use frequencies up to 50 gigahertz. This is the red line. You see that red line right there? That's 50 gigahertz. I marked it. And here we have human body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. And if we put the two together, here's water at zero degrees, here's water at 25, water at 50, water at 75. So we put 35, 37, it's right in between, you know, 37.5 degrees is right in between 25 and 50. So we mark that there. Look at our dielectric constant. This is the ability of water to absorb this energy. And you can see just how much different it is compared to, let's say, one gigahertz, which is up here, right? This is like 4G signals. 4G is like kind of right in the zone. And so for, for a human body, we'd be like right about here for like 4G, but then 5G, now we're on the bottom of that curve. We've seen this huge increase in our ability to absorb that. And that's why so many people are feeling uh, so many health effects just in the past few years. There are other factors too, like uh, various genetic, uh, uh, modification vaccines that are now being released, but there's also this 5G factor of where we're just absorbing so much energy from that now in our natural day-to-day 24-7. And the thing with uh, 5G cell networks is that because they use a higher frequency, the energy attenuates out quicker, it gets absorbed easier, especially into, again, like water. So that's why it doesn't work well when it's raining or things of that nature. It's kind of cloudy out, misty out, 5G goes to crap and we're absorbing it. And so they have to put more towers out, they have to pump more power into it. So it's just like, it's almost like the rocket equation where you have to add more fuel to the rocket for it to go higher, which adds more weight to the rocket. So you have to add more fuel. And this is all just basically pumping energy into our body, information into our body, who knows what that information is, and it's just not good, we didn't evolve in this. So there's also Faraday's law. We, we know that uh, magnetic fields induce electric currents in conductive materials. A pulse magnetic field, like these gigahertz fields, or even like the power grid at 50, 60 hertz, Schumann resonances, but anything that's a pulse field It'll interact with an electric circuit and produce electro, uh, electromotive forces. So these are electric currents. And the power of these electric currents corresponds to the strength of the magnetic field and the conductivity of the circuit. So we're highly conductive. We have all these circuits in our body. Our, our entire body is one circuit, like the chakra system, but you have circuits within your brain, all the different neural circuits, uh, and you have your, your heart and all these. There's so many different circuits within our body we're highly conductive, and these pulse magnetic fields are able to induce these electric currents within us. And electromagnetic induction occurs because you have that changing magnetic field stimulating the movement of things like electrons and ions. So there's just more vibration of electrons and ions in our body now than we had in the past. And that's a problem because that creates stress. That is overall stressful to the body it's less coherent and orderly. The body likes to know, okay, we have our ions here, we have our electrons there, okay, let's open up the ion channel, but they're always in flux now, they're always going all over the place. You, you, need, you may need more of these things, you may need to have uh, more antioxidants in your body to counter these free radical effects, and it gets really crazy. And this is just Faraday's law. We just know that magnetic fields induce electric currents within things that are conductive. We're highly conductive and we're pumping our environment with tons of um, electromagnetic energies. And so we can also though pump in these energies into our body. We also see, like consciously, we also see uh, our energy increase happening now uh, from like the sun and from other environmental kind of natural factors. Here we have our solar cycle sunspot progression from 1900 to 2030. And we see that there was this increase from solar cycle 14 up to 19. 19 is the strongest solar cycle we've had in the past 120 plus years. Uh, we see the sunspot numbers went above 30, uh, 300 at one point. But now you can see that we've been on this decline since the late 50s, early 60s. And so 20 was kind of an anomalous low, 16 is also anomalous low, 24, our most recent solar cycle, was an anomalous low. 
And now we're on this decrease. And so this decrease may continue past 25. Like for example, solar cycle 23 may be equivalent to 24 or even weaker, right? It may be uh, the same strength as 25. We don't know yet. Uh, but we do see that for solar cycle 24, we had this anomalous low, and now we are on an energy increase as compared to that. So we may still be in a period of overall declining solar activity. 26 and 27 will confirm the longer trends that are at play with the sun. But we do know that solar cycle 25 is stronger and it's more aggressive than solar cycle 24, which indicates a shorter period trend of increasing solar energy flux. And that's happening right now. So there's more energy in our environment also due to solar cycle 25. And these subtle energies of our planet are in constant flux from these internal and external factors. So sun and cosmos, but there's also internal factors like uh, from our core and within the lithosphere, earthquakes, things of that nature. So now with the sun awakening from this extended period of decreasing energy output, which culminated with the anomalous low of solar cycle 24, at least 25 is stronger than 24. Earth is receiving more solar energy, and this time it's happening with a radically different atmospheric composition. So we have 420 parts per million CO2, we have less ozone, especially where it matters. We have more ozone at the surface, which is toxic. We have less ozone up in the high atmosphere where it's protective uh, from solar radiation. And we have more particulates. This is bad. It changes the Carnegie curve, how the atmosphere uh, naturally has diurnal conductivity variations. It's low during the morning. It kind of goes high during late afternoon. Particulates can give you three or four spikes in atmospheric conductivity at the surface. And we are within, you know, we are these highly conductive biologic antennas immersed in the overall global electric circuit. So you change that global electric circuit at your location and that could change the biologic uh, rhythms and functions in, uh, of your body. And so this, these changing atmospheric compositions are uh, dramatically different than even just compared to 200 years ago. Here we have a graphic showing CO2. Uh, this is 800,000 years ago. Here's now you can see how different it is. So there's man-made influences on this. There's also natural factors. There's a whole bunch and we're not getting into the whole climate change debate. This is just hard data facts. We know that CO2 is much higher than it used to be. And now with things like more x-rays coming in, enhanced proton flux, enhanced ionospheric currents, stronger geomagnetic pulsations, stronger Schumann resonances, stronger telluric currents, there's just more energy overall amplifying any energy that we're carrying internally. So we really need to be mindful and consciously choose our energy imprint as a result. We can look even more at Earth's changing atmosphere. We see that carbon dioxide, there's the red line, methane and green, uh, nitrous oxide, those aren't gases you want to be breathing in. Let's not forget that CO2 is toxic and oxygen is vital for animals. So yeah, plants might like CO2, but it's toxic to us. So CO2 going up while oxygen goes down, we see oxygen going down here is not good for health. Here we have 800,000 years of oxygen, 800,000 right there, zero, and we can see this subtle decrease in oxygen, 21.12%. Uh, is this marker right there, and now we're slipping underneath 21%. So a subtle change, but a change nevertheless. This is from 1990 to 2024, and we see how oxygen has just continuously gone down. This is measured uh, at Cape Grimm. This is oxygen to nitrogen uh, ratio there, so it's just been going down. So our atmosphere has been changing. And what we have observed with these atmospheric changes of more carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide and more particulates and less ozone where it matters and less oxygen is that we have been seeing increased global thunderstorm activity. And with thunderstorm frequency and intensity increasing, so too does power of the Schumann resonances. That 7.8 Hertz foundational mode is the same frequency effectively as that carrier wave used by Luc Montagnier and team showing the transfer of energy and information from vial one with the DNA to vial two, that was this pure clean water that then reconstructed that vial DNA sequence. And remember, 
uh, vi viral. Remember, a virus is basically just like a little shell around a DNA sequence. There's very little more. So you could perhaps even have these viruses get created without any real contact, but transmitted, that electromagnetic energy is transmitted through a carrier wave and all the DNA sequences are there and available, all of a sudden, boom, you have a virus kind of materialize and get created as a result. That is a possibility. Um, so I wanna focus here. These Schumann resonances are gonna be increasing, it seems, over the next uh, decades in their strength. Some estimates for the global electric circuit have it that there's gonna be a like 10 to 20 times increase in thunderstorm activity as a result of uh, just the changing solar inputs and the atmospheric composition changing, allowing for these uh, a, a greater electrification of our atmosphere and as a result of the biosphere and of ourselves. And we see in the human brain an affinity for Schumann resonances, especially in the caudal regions. So here we have low affinity Schumann, humans with a, a low affinity for the Schumann resonances and then people with a high affinity. There's of course natural individual variability and with these high affinity people, you could call them energy sensitives. You see the caudal region has a really big increase at mode three, 20 Hertz. Here's mode two, 14 Hertz. There's mode one, 7.8 Hertz or so. Uh, you see them marked here, the frequency axis, different parts of the brain. You see a bump also for um, mode two there in the middle and rostral regions. Uh, also slight increases there for uh, mode one but really it's the caudal regions here, that brainstem where there's a ton of magnetite. You have the most magnetosomes in the brainstem in addition to the outer covering of the brain, uh, also in the hippocampi. And the hippocampi right here, they pulse uh, at eight hertz. The entorhinal cortex pulses at eight hertz. The hippocampus pulses at eight hertz. This is part of the temporal lobe manages emotions through the amygdala. It's our memory database, that's the hippocampus. Language zone, we're Nikki's area, spatial and temporal awareness, signal processing for the senses. There's both sides, they're like an antenna themselves. You know, you want two, two antennas on each side, two ears. Uh, so we, are, we have this natural biology to connect to these energy fields. They are amplifying right now as a result of many factors, one of them being artificial EMFs, the other being natural energy increases as a result of solar cycle 25. And so it's important now to modulate the nervous system. There's things that you can do to modulate your autonomic nervous system to help make those energies more coherent. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide, but just really quickly wanna show you some of the things that I do to enhance parasympathetic activity. So you can steep equal parts chamomile, mugwort, and blue lotus flower with water. This is like a dream tea. This is the spirituality tea mix that I sold that I'll, I'll blend up a new batch sometime soon and offer that again to you all. Uh, you can also add passion flower to that. And so this is really good for enhancing your overall like third eye and crown chakra energies. Uh, really good for enhancing parasympathetic activity. It's anti-inflammatory helps you with sleep. If you just want a basic overall wellness go-to drink, then chamomile, passion flower combined is excellent. You can also do chamomile, uh, passion flower, and dandelion root. That's actually probably what I would do for basic overall wellness. And uh, for a microbiome gut brain axis boost, you have chamomile, dandelion, and lemongrass. So, I mean, you can play with all these different herbs, combine them together in different ways. You can drink these while fasting. There's also uh, medicinal mushrooms. So you have like turkey tail, you have red reishi. These are really good. Ashwagandha is an adaptogen, really good for your parasympathetic nervous system. They help you decrease stress, ameliorate fatigue, improve sleep, lower inflammation, improve immunity. Yes, they do all those things. Uh, and if you are drinking a lot of coffee, this cut that down. I don't think one or two cups of coffee a day is a problem unless you already have adrenal fatigue. Um, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome. But if you're drinking three, five, six, ten cups, you're Italian, then skip skip the extra coffee, okay? And go with some of these other teas here, and that will be much better for you. So the reason why it's so important that we go inwards is because by going inwards, we discover what it is that we may unconsciously be imprinting ourselves with. So these could be 
uh, unhealed traumas, for example, limiting beliefs. I think you guys know what I'm talking about. And so when we go in and we reformat that, now that new energy that we're consciously choosing, you could say the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That is an excellent place to start. You have prayers like, I am love, we are love, or just, I pray for the liberation of all suffering for life on this planet. Like clearing out all these old, stuck, negative energies that we no longer need. We, we can ascend, and this really starts with the energy that we imprint ourselves with, our, our cells, our water, and so this is really powerful. And so when you do this, and when you start to imprint yourself with different energies, you move into coherence, appreciation, love, care. You see how the heart rate changes like this. Heart rate variability forms this really nice sine wave pattern. It's no longer incoherent. This is marked by like anxiety or frustration, irritation, you're worried. Really jagged lines all over the place. There's no clean rhythm here. So you improve your biorhythms by doing this inner exploration, by consciously choosing the energies they want, by reframing your mind, and this energy is better able to resonate and broadcast out. We also see this if we look at our power spectral density plots for the heart. This is just one example, but we look here for appreciation. We see clear energy spikes. There's one hertz, that's your 60 beats per minute heart rate. Here's four hertz, we see the Schumann resonance mode one right there. But when this person had anger in their heart, you see really no clear spikes, no clear kind of energy signature, and it's more chaotic, incoherent. So when you choose the energy and mindset and feeling that you want to carry, water will hold on to all that, radiate that out, and together we can create a larger change of resonance across the entire planet. The people near you will feel it stronger, but as more and more antennas come online, we're like we are the ultimate like 5G network, like beyond 5G. This is like life G, you could say. We really need to, to turn on our own love network, care network, appreciation, gratitude network, compassion network, and radiate that energy out. People have been doing this, of course, for thousands of years, but now with the internet, we can reach each other in ways that before was impossible. I mean, that's why I'm so, I need to make this video to share this with all, all of you and anyone that's seen this in the future. And if we turn on our own network of love, we can really transform the planet. And as these energies are coming in stronger and stronger from the sun, from the Schumann resonances, etc., it's more important than ever because It'll also make that process faster. If we become heart-centered and embody love consciousness, each and every one of us, then as that energy comes in, the transformation is going to be rapid. It'll be exponential. It'll be faster than we think. It'll be slow until all of a sudden it happens. And then that judgment type event actually has occurred, but not in this like grim apocalyptic way. At least that's a future reality that I can envision. So one important thing with all this is your gut health. Uh, I have a holistic gut health guide, 88 page guide that I wrote based on my 10 year gut health journey from about 20 to 30. And I mention this because your gut brain axis, your microbiome gut brain consciousness axis is a key part in having the ability to do this conscious imprinting and making it easier, improves your overall health and wellness, reduces inflammation, will kind of solve some of the effects of the artificial EMFs. A lot of people have altered gut health right now. It's really bad. I think more people have gut problems than they realize. And so you can read this guide and learn how to improve your gut health naturally, holistically, just through diet modification, behavioral uh, resets, things like fasting, energy imprinting into your food. Uh, and if you do that, then this makes the whole process easier. You're, you know, you'll solve a lot of depression and mental health issues by, by working on your gut. Uh, and so you can get that, use the link in the video description, 10% off using the code gut help, all one word.
Last thing, water energy infusion. Like we are water. We have, of course, 99% of our body's water by molecular count, 70% by mass. But you can also start this process with actual water that you're drinking. So you can put it in your hands and you can radiate the energy and information that you want into it. And I uh, did this extensively for a while until I just kind of merged into just always trying to hold that imprint all the time. So I'm printing the, the water my entire body. Of course, you know, whatever energy that you're holding and radiating out with your heart is also hitting your body at the same time as this water that you're infusing. But this is a very powerful way to make this practice conscious and then turn it into something that you just do instinctively. And that's the goal is to take a lot of health and wellness practices, a lot of spiritual practices. You have to do them consciously at first and then they just become instinctual. You just do them naturally. Uh, and so you can do water energy infusion. That's really, really powerful. So I hope you found this video useful and helpful. If you like the video, please click the like button. It helps this channel grow. Please subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this. I cover the changing energetics on our planet, in our solar system, astrology, space weather, Schumann resonances, but also our biology, uh, bioelectricity, so much more. So this is a one-stop shop. I have the Holistic Gut Health Guide for you. At times I have tea blends available. Uh, right now I'm traveling, I don't have them, but you can subscribe and I'll let you know when those tea blends are back. There's other resources that I offer as well. So uh, again, thank you so much for watching this video. Blessings to you, love and light, and namaste.